Welcome to the organic chemistry section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 96 to 100. So first, I'll show you guys the questions so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 96, 97, 98, 99, and 100. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 96, it says the molecule below has two sites for deprotonation, with corresponding pKa values of approximately negative 6 and 0. Which of the following correctly describes the state of this molecule when dissolved in pH buffers of 10 and 5? So we have this molecule, it's symmetrical, there are two sites that it can be deprotonated at, so it doesn't really matter which one is negative 6 or which, one's a zero, which one is 0. So we can just say that the first one is negative 6, the next one is 0 after that. So what you need to know about pKa values, we have two sides of deprotonation, we have pKa values, negative 6 and 0, and then we have, we want to know the state when dissolved in these pH buffers. So the key thing to know about pKa values are that they are the pH at which we have a half-half or one-to-one -one ratio of the deprotonated form and the protonated form of any acid. So if the first one is negative 6, then that means that when we are at pH negative 6, we're going to have half of the molecule being deprotonated at, let's say, the top site is negative 6, half deprotonated at the top site, and half still protonated. And then when we go at least one pH value beyond that, then we have either fully protonated or de fully deprotonated. So if we have negative 6, one below it is negative 7. At that point, we're completely protonated because it's very acidic, so a lot of protons present. Whereas if we go one above at negative five, now it's completely deprotonated because we're going more basic. So first of all, we have it at pH of 10. So we have, let's say this one's negative six, this one's zero. At a pH of, sorry, pH of positive 10. At a pH of 10, is that at least one removed from negative six? Yes because you just need negative 5 for this to be deprotonated. So this one is deprotonated. 0, you just need to get it to 1 to deprotonate that one. So this one is also deprotonated. So if we're talking about at pH of 10, pH of 10, they're both deprotonated. Next, if we're talking about a pH of 5, same thing. It's still one removed, so the top one is deprotonated, and then the bottom one is also deprotonated. If we had something else, like if we were at, let's say, a pH of negative 3, then we say that the top one is fully deprotonated, but the bottom one is not. It's still protonated. But based on the two buffers that we were given, we see that at both, they're going to be fully deprotonated, both the top and the bottom site. So let's look at the answers now. Option A is saying for both buffers, both nitrogen sites will remain protonated. So that's incorrect. It's actually the opposite. And B is correct. For both buffers, both nitrogen sites will be deprotonated. Option C is saying for both, the nitrogen site with a lower pK will be deprotonated and the other will not. And C and D are kind of saying the same thing. One will be deprotonated and one won't be, but both of those statements are incorrect based on what we just said. So B is the correct answer here. In question 97, it says, given the molecule on the left, what will happen to the pKa if an azido group, which is on the right, replaces one of the hydrogens from the methyl group? The structure of the azido group is shown to the right of the original molecule. So we're saying if instead of three hydrogens here, there were two, and then the other thing it was bonded to was this over here, was like this. So on the left side, if that azido group was added, what would happen to the pK? So we're asked, what will happen to the pK? So pK is talking about how acidic a molecule is. So when this is, when it acts like an acid, then what happens is it will lose its proton and be deprotonated, and therefore it will have a negative charge on the oxygen that is transferred throughout the carboxylic acid through resonance. However, that oxygen does not like to have the negative charge, even if it's, if it's carried by two oxygens instead of just one. And therefore, if there's anything which can also take on this electron density, that will be favorable. 
So now that we have this azido group, there's a lot of there's some resonance going on, and therefore there's electron density which can be donated into this electron withdrawing group, this azido group. Therefore, that base which is formed, the conjugate base after deprotonation, is now more stable, and it's going to exist for a longer time. So that means that this molecule has now become more acidic, and therefore its pK has lowered. So just keep that in mind. If something is more acidic, it has a lower pK. If it's a higher pK, then it's something that's more basic. And if we added something which was a electron, which was an electron donating group instead of an electron withdrawing, it would actually have the opposite effect. It would make it less acidic and therefore pKa would go up. But in this case, what we said, our conclusion is that pKa will go, will go down. So option A is saying the molecule's pKa will increase because the azido group stabilizes the negatively charged conjugate base. That's incorrect. It won't increase but B is correct, it will decrease, and for that same reason. C is incorrect because it's saying it will increase again, and it's also saying that the azido group destabilizes the conjugate base, but it actually stabilizes it. That's why D is incorrect. It did say that the pK will decrease, but it said it's because it, the azido group will destabilize the conjugate base, but that doesn't make sense. You have to stabilize something for it to be around longer, and that's what's going on here. If you stabilize the conjugate base, it's around longer, Therefore, the, eight, the acid part is not around longer, so the acid goes towards the conjugate base. Therefore, it's more acidic, therefore lower pK. So B is the correct answer. In question 98, it says, if two particular isomers of a compound are epimers, then what other stereochemical relationship do these compounds have? So two, com two isomers are epimers. What other relationship holds true? So what is an epimer? For this, you need to... For this question, you need to know the definitions of enantiomers, diastereomers, epimers, all these different stereoisomers. So an epimer, that describes a pair of molecules that differ at just one chiral center. So they can have multiple chiral, chiral centers, say they have four, but at number three, that's the one at which they differ, these two epimers, these two molecules, but at the rest, they have the same stereochemistry. So they're not a enantiomers, and an antimer is a complete mirror image of its pair. Therefore, that means that at every chiral center, it would be it would be inverted. But we're told, or what we should know for an epimer is that for the other chiral centers, it's the same, but it just changes at one. B is also incorrect. They're not conformers. So conformers are the actual same molecule. So like one molecule in a pair of enantiomers or diastereomers. We're just talking about one molecule. And if we start rotating the the atoms around one bond, we can get things like anti, gauche, and staggered. Those are conformers, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about not just one molecule, but a pair of molecules. So B is incorrect, but C is correct. C is the right answer. They're diastereomers. What's a diastereomer? It differs from an enantiomer in that it doesn't, it doesn't differ at all the different chiral centers. If it differs at all of them, then it's an enantiomer because it's a complete mirror image, but a diastereomer, it differs at at least one, but not all of them. So diastereomers could just, if there are four chiral centers once again, if they differ at just chiral centers three, then they're diastereomers. And then they're also epimers because epimers specifically differ at just one chiral center. But if they differed at two out of four, then they'd still be diastereomers because they're differing at some, but not all of the chiral centers. And then they're not epimers anymore because they're not just differentiating at one. And they're definitely not enantiomers because they're not differentiating at all chiral centers. So epimers are by definition also diastereomers. And then D is incorrect. They're not tautomers. So tautomers are different forms that can kind of change between each other due to resonance. So for example, if I have something that looks like this, its tautomer would look like this. And it's just changing between the two forms by redistributing electrons. And so that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about one molecule, once again, changing into different forms. We're talking about two actual distinct molecules. So C is the correct answer. In question 99, we're asked which, whole, which of the following holds true regarding conformational isomers. So what is true about conformational isomers? So we're talking about things like anti, gauche, and staggered. Option A is saying they contain less similarity than stereoisomers. So compared to things like 
enantiomers and diastereomers, do they have less similarity? That's incorrect. They would actually have more. Because when we're talking about enantiomers, we're talking about things, for example, that are, if we're talking about enantiomers or diastereomers, but let's say we're talking about enantiomers, we're talking about two things that are complete mirror images of each other, but we're talking about two molecules. And so they do differ in that the orientation of the groups in 3D space is different, but in a conformational isomer, we're talking about just one molecule. So an enantiomer would be a pair of molecules, but in a conformational isomer, we're just talking about one molecule. And then if we take a bond and we look down it and we look at the two atoms that are connected in this bond, if we're just rotating things around that one single bond, that's what a conformational isomer is. So since we're just talking about one molecule versus two, this is going to be more similar than stereoisomers. So the last part makes this false. B saying eclipse conformation is always less favorable than staggered. That's also not always true. So if we have something like this, then possibly if we had two oxygens, for example, they can have a favorable interaction in the, like for example, in the case of hydrogen bonding. So something can happen where the interaction is favorable enough that it overcomes a steric hindrance, that steric problem. So even though, yes, this is not as stable as if they were further apart, the hydrogen bonding is a favorable enough reaction that it will bring them together. So sometimes you can have an eclipse conformation that's more favorable than staggered. And we do see this often in some mechanisms when we try to explain a reaction going from the observed reactants to the observed products, then the only way it makes sense is if it went through eclipsed, even though normally we might think that eclipse is less favorable due to the steric hindrance. Option C is saying they all exist at the same energy state. That's not true. Anti, Gauss, eclipsed, these exist at different energy states. That's the whole point of having these different conformations and seeing which one is the most favorable. So D would therefore have to be the correct answer. None of the above is true regarding conformational isomers. In question 100, it says the reaction of a single alcohol with the following compound produces a blank. We're talking about a single alcohol with this compound. If we have just one OH reacting, what we get is a compound that looks like this. That OR is the alcohol that reacted. However, if we had two, well, we had OR, sorry. So on the arrow, it should be OR. What we would have is that original OH, which came from that carbonyl is gone. And now we have two ORs. So the molecule at the top, that is called a hemiacetal. And this one at the bottom, that's called an acetal. It's an acetal if it has two OR groups. A hemi is just halfway, halfway there. So it just has one alcohol group. And therefore, the correct answer would be B, because we're saying that we have a reaction of a single alcohol, not two equivalents, but a single alcohol. So it's a hemiacetal. It's not an acetal. And then ketal and hemiketal, those are the equivalent, but we're talking about ketones. In this case, you see that the molecule that we start with is an aldehyde. So we're talking about either acetal or hemiacetal. That's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. The link is right here as well as in the description below. And in that course, we go through questions just like we did here and go through all the different answer explanations, explaining why each one is correct or incorrect. Other than that, make sure to subscribe here to stay up to date with the videos that we post. And that's it for this video. 